All right, let's jump in. Thanks everyone for coming to talk about CDS Hooks. Uh, I'm Josh Mandel. I'm going to be talking about CDS Hooks this morning and fire bulk data in the afternoon. And in the middle, I'll also put in a plug for a quick session that I'm doing uh, with Janet Campbell that's going to be relevant for anyone doing CDS Hooks, which is on a draft specification that we're building out called Smart Web Messaging. So that's right after uh, this meeting in chalet number two. Um, I want to keep this informal, so by all means, at any point as we're going, please raise your hand or shout out a question, especially if something I say is unclear, but also if there's just something you'd like to know. Um, I got a link to the slides here so that you can follow along, and these slides also link out uh, to the official documentation for CDS Hooks, as well as the sandbox environment and some demos and tutorials so that you can follow along. The big goal of CDS Hooks is, is what we label here with a pile of adjectives, vendor agnostic, workflow integrated, clinical decision support. Uh, and I have to, first of all, point out that most of the slides in this deck come from um, an open deck that Kevin Shackleton maintains. So Kevin Shackleton these days is the project lead uh, for CDS Hooks, and he's got a presentation, uh, good material that I, I borrowed from heavily in putting these slides together. So most of this is derived from Kevin's deck, it's hosted on GitHub at that link. Big picture, the goal of CDS Hooks is to provide workflow integration inside of EHR systems uh, for decision support. And this comes from uh, the team that I've been running on the Smart Health IT project. We began this project uh, back in 2015, and it's being developed uh, as an open source, uh, Creative Commons licensed specification with a set of client libraries and developer tools, and it's an emerging standard inside of the HL7 community. So this started off as what you might call a research project in the, the Harvard Medical School world, uh, and it's, it's been passed along to the standards development process inside of HL7. So I want to give you an example to motivate sort of one aspect of why this kind of technology is important. So as smart apps reach uh, broader prevalence in the world, you can integrate many kinds of apps inside of your clinical record system. So this is an example of uh, an app that was built at Intermountain Healthcare for taking care of newborn infants, in particular infants who have a higher than normal bilirubin level, which, which can be dangerous and needs to be treated. And depending on how high it is, uh, the modality of treatment is different. So the team at Intermountain put together from their clinical experience an app that visualizes the risk of a particular uh, newborn patient, and based on the risk stratification, might recommend one kind of treatment or another. And this app is incredibly powerful clinically, right? They've got it integrated into their Cerner EHR system, but it can integrate into any smart compatible EHR, and it helps you make potentially life-saving decisions for a newborn infant. Really important, powerful stuff. It's a, it's a fabulous application. Um, but there's a major but, which is a clinician needs to know to actually run this app if they want to get that information at the point of care. Um, so it's great if you know that you should be asking the question, but there's a lot of clinical questions you could be asking all day long, and you might not think to run every possible app that could answer every possible question. This is one of the main motivations behind CDS Hooks. So instead of expecting clinicians to know exactly which tools to run, to get which kinds of advice uh, when they need it, how do we pair up externally derived advice into the clinical workflow so it's available sort of ambiently. So the system becomes more intelligent and responds to choices that are being made and events that are happening in the background. So that's the overall motivation for CDS Hooks. Uh, and it's worth saying from the perspective of the sort of standards development community, doesn't Fire already have a way to do uh, CDS? If you go to the Fire specification, one of the major uh, strata on top of that spec from uh, infrastructure resources up to clinical and administrative, uh, at the top there's clinical decision support? And, and the answer is yes, FIRE does have a set of resources built in for trying to express uh, domain logic in clinical decision support, being able to express things like rules and consequences and expectations. Um, CDS Hooks is not, not exactly about expressing your clinical logic in a computable form. It's actually about connecting to a remote decision support system outside of your EHR that might be making these decisions in all manner of different ways. And so we'll try to talk about what some of those could be and give some motivation for understanding why this is an important distinction. So it's not just about expressing, it's not, it's not at all about expressing clinical content. Uh, it's about being able to hook into the workflow and display advice in a way that integrates really nicely. So I mentioned this is a project that we started back in 2015, effectively with a, a little seminar that, that I hosted at Harvard, put together a group of people who were sort of interested in decision support, either on the EHR vendor side or, the, or on 
the decision support services vendor side. We had a meeting, we sort of talked through some of the basic ideas, and there was pretty strong interest in, in seeing this kind of technology uh, develop. And over the course of the last few years, Kevin Shackleton at Cerner has taken over as the project lead. He's been taking this forward through the HL7 standardization process, and there's been a strong community that's grown up specifically around this specification. So each time we have a connectathon at the HL7 meetings, there's a very large track for clinical decision support hooks, 30 or 40 people showing up at those meetings, uh, specifically to work on that track. It's been the, the biggest track uh, in the Connectathon uh, for the last several running. Uh, and we're on the way to a 1.0 publication. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means, what's in scope for 1.0. Um, but we're anticipating that's going to come out towards the end of 2018 or early 2019 as a, an initial spec that goes through the HL7 draft standardization process. This is just a little bit about setting some of the community background, who, who's involved in the project. Uh, the other major support we've had has been from the Argonaut Project. It's a group of US-based EHR vendors uh, and hospital networks that have been trying to promote uh, and drive forward the, the state of interoperability specs. So in 2017, the Argonaut Group took on CDS Hooks as one of the major projects. Uh, and in addition to funding a review of the clinical specification, there was also a security review. Uh, so the content that went into the HL7 sort of balloting process to become a standard uh, was the content that sort of made it through this stage of the Argonaut process and, and had a very focused review back in 2017. Uh, and again, to give you a sense of community, there's been strong participation from the EHR vendor world, and those are the logos that you see uh, on the screen here. Uh, but around the EHR vendors, we've had a tremendous number of decision support vendors and, and companies and services who are interested in and starting to build prototypes of this technology, uh, connecting to these EHRs, all today in what I would describe as a connectathon or prototype environment. This technology is not in production EHR systems today. So I want to be super clear about the fact that this is exciting technology. I, I love the direction it's taking us in, and there's been strong interest. But it's not real yet in the sense that you can't go and push a service into production uh, pretty much anywhere today. So we're on the cusp of seeing something pretty cool happen. Uh, and I want to talk more now about how the actual specification works and what are the underlying technologies that have got people so interested. Uh, so a couple of definitions to get started. First of all, what is a clinical decision support service? This is something that is some kind of clinical logic or knowledge that's embedded in a service that's developed externally from the EHR system, and it's invoked by the EHR using something we'll call a hook, and we'll talk about the details of how that invocation works. But the idea is this service has its own embedded logic that it's going to use to provide some advice back to the clinician in the context of that workflow. And the advice takes the form of what we call a card. We'll talk about different kinds of cards that can be displayed uh, in the EHR alongside that workflow. So critically, the way that that external service is generating the advice, uh, we don't try to define it. So it could be simple flowchart logic, a decision tree. Uh, it could be a neural network. Uh, it could be just magic or a Ouija board or random numbers, right? This is out of scope for the clinical decision support spec. We say that a service has some way of generating these cards, however it does it. Um, so there's a real separation of concerns here. On the one hand, uh, there's responsibilities of the EHR. And on the other hand, there's responsibilities of the clinical decision support uh, service provider. So things like looking at what happens in the clinical workflow and triggering these API calls or these hooks, that's the EHR's responsibility. Uh, things like invoking the right kinds of decision support logic, that's on the CDS service provider. Uh, so the EHR provides the context and the information that the CDS service needs to do its job. If the CDS service needs extra data, and we'll talk about what that would mean, um, it can go and make its own API calls to fetch those extra data uh, from anywhere in practice. Uh, but a major important source of those extra data would be going back to the EHR system and asking for something more. Uh, but when it comes to presenting the decision support results, presenting those cards inside of the workflow, again, that's the responsibility of the EHR. Uh, so there's a back and forth and the set, a set of responsibilities that fall on one side uh, of the other. The basic idea here is that in the context of working in the EHR, a clinician navigates to different screens, takes certain steps, prescribes a medication, writes an order, documents a problem. Uh, and the idea is that we instrument that clinical workflow. We instrument that path through the EHR with certain events or hooks that the EHR um, considers as points for integrating external decision support. So we've got a few examples that we've built into the spec. But this is an open set. The idea is that as a community, we can start to build out this catalog of important workflow events or hooks that happen inside of the clinical workflow. So our examples that we started with uh, include one very simple but very general purpose hook called patient view. Uh, 
So the idea here is when you open up a patient chart, maybe you're viewing uh, a face sheet with some summary information, uh, that action of opening up a new chart, that triggers what we call the patient view hook. So any decision support service that wants to make sure there's something that the clinician sees on opening the chart, they can listen for that kind of hook. We also have a hook in our example catalog that's specific to prescribing medications. So as you're going through the course of writing a prescription, this medication prescribe hooks get, gets fired. Uh, and the idea is it's not wait until you've written a whole prescription and just at the end before you hit the sign button uh, we'll call out for some advice. The idea is to incorporate this advice as early as possible. Um, so if you're going through a multi-step process where you pick a drug and you enter a dose, every one of those steps is an opportunity to call out for this kind of advice uh, from an external decision support service. Uh, and then finally, it's very common in an EHR workflow to make a set of orders all together. Maybe you're admitting a new patient from the emergency department and you want to get the right nutrition orders and the right uh, lab testing orders set up and the right kinds of rooms set up, and you've got a whole group of orders together. Uh, so we've also defined an example hook called order review, the idea being before you sign off on a, a basket of orders like that, external services might have an opportunity to suggest some consolidation or notice something that you've missed uh, in an order set, an opportunity to add something to the set uh, as you go. So those are some of the examples uh, that we've started from, but we don't try to model every aspect of what happens in the EHR with these hooks. We say this is an open set. So let me give you a sense of the workflow then for calling out one of these hooks from the EHR, and the example that I'll use is medication ordering. Uh, so let's say you've got a clinician working inside of the EHR. There's a patient record open, uh, and they're in the context of writing a prescription for uh, metoprolol, high blood pressure medication. Uh, and they're in the process of saying, okay, I'm going to pick maybe a 50 milligram daily dose. So as they're entering that information, the EHR triggers one of these CDS hooks. Uh, it invokes a remote CDS service, or possibly multiple services, to say, hey, Dr. Mandel is in the process of writing this prescription. Do you have any advice for him? And so the service sort of cranks its wheels, it executes its logic or its Ouija board or its neural net or whatever it's doing. Uh, it might need to fetch some more data, uh, so maybe it wants to know about um, the patient's medication allergies before it suggests uh, an alternate medication to choose. So it might go and fetch more data in this process. Uh, but once it's done that, once it's rendered its kind of decisions or, or advice, it returns a set of these cards that capture the device, uh, the advice, back to the EHR system. And the EHR system displays those cards. Uh, so it could be something simple like information that the clinician might want to know in the process of writing a prescription. So we call that an information card. And the example you'll see in the slide here is pricing information. So maybe you just ambiently would like to know that this prescription is going to be $200 a month. Uh, that's an example of an information card. On the other hand, the external service might have a proposal. It might say you might want to change this uh, to a different antihypertensive medication uh, for many different reasons. Uh, and, and so the service can provide what's called an advice or a suggestion card, and that comes with a, a button, effectively, that the EHR can display. So if the clinician wants to take that suggestion, it's as simple as clicking a button, and the EHR will propagate the change uh, through the user interface. Um, or, in the more general case, maybe the app wants to have a conversation with the clinician, right? Maybe it's too hard to just give advice uh, knowing just a little bit that you could get from the clinical context and from structured data. Uh, so the, the service can also launch or, or provide what's called an app link card to say, I think I'm going to have some advice for you if you want to launch um, a particular app that's going to help with hyper, uh, antihypertensive dosing guidelines, for example. So you may have a set of guidelines that are implemented as an app, uh, and the clinical decision support service notices that a, a prescriber is writing a hypertension prescription, and it says, maybe you want to launch this hypertension app now. Uh, and so the user can launch that smart app from inside the context of that workflow by clicking on a link in a card. So those are the three kinds of cards that we define. Um, and I want to give you a little bit of a sense of what's happening over the wire as we navigate through that diagram. So on the first hand, as I'm writing a prescription in the EHR, and the EHR wants to invoke that hook, what it's doing is it's sending a JSON payload to a hook endpoint um, as you can see here. So the CDS service exposes an endpoint like this example service endpoint, and the EHR posts a payload like this. It says, here's the hook that we're invoking. In this case, it's a patient view hook. Uh, here's the fire server that you should go to if you need to get more data about the current patient. And here's some contextual information. And this context is hook specific. So when we see the context here um, on the patient view hook, we know that when you're doing a patient view, you need to know the user, you need to know the patient, you need to know the encounter. Um, that's sort of the minimum set of context that you should always have when you're doing a patient view hook. So it sends that information along as well. And the CDS service then cranks on whatever logic it's got, 
and after that, it returns in the form of this JSON payload a set of cards. Uh, so in this case, uh, you can see there's a JSON array of these cards, and each one might have a summary, might have uh, some information about where it came from. Um, and we'll talk about this indicator as well. Uh, but the idea here is that not all cards are created equal. Some might be just simple FYI kind of information, and some might be kind of important, and some might be really critical. Uh, like, here's advice that if you don't know about it, uh, you're probably doing something wrong, or you might be making a mistake here. Um, so this idea of indicator levels is something that we'll come back to. Uh, each card, though, basically has uh, a set of data that describes what a user is supposed to see. But the EHR is responsible for rendering it, for deciding the color schemes and the fonts and the layouts, and whether it goes off to the side of the screen in sort of an information area, or whether it's displayed in a more prominent place. So the cards are a data description of what should be shown, and they include a concise sort of Twitter-length summary, um, and they include this indicator about importance and some information about the source of the, uh, the advice or the information. So what's the organization responsible uh, for giving this advice? So I want to take you through a quick view of the indicators. Uh, we've been back and forth a bit on sort of what are the right set of status indicators, how many levels should there be, uh, but we looked at this as sort of a happy medium to say some cards are just informational, some cards may contain a warning, and some cards may have critical information for, a, for uh, the user to know. Uh, and so each card is labeled with one of these three uh, levels of indicator, and the EHR uses this uh, as a hint or a guide to rendering that card and to displaying it for the user. So some examples, we talked about information cards, we talked about suggestion cards, we talked about app link cards, and I just want to give you a sense of how an EHR might render those kinds of cards in the context of the workflow. But I also want to point out uh, that cards are not limited to just one of these three categories. A card can have information, it can have suggestions, and it can have app links uh, all embedded in the same card. And when a CDS service returns these cards, it can return a whole set of cards. So it might have a few different suggestions that it might present on separate cards, depending on, um, depending on the kind of workflow that it's trying to enable. So there can be any combination of that content that's displayed for the user to see. Um, and then in terms of the workflow, one additional thing that I want to point out is this concept of a CDS service fetching additional information. So in the context of e-prescribing, I gave you the example of medication allergies. By default, those don't come along. They're not part of the context, but a service might want to get those data. It might issue a fire API call back to the EHR uh, to fetch those data. Uh, and that's very powerful and general purpose uh, because it gives, the opportunity, it gives a service the opportunity to look at the information it's got to start, decide what additional information it might need, and then go run a set of those queries to fetch data from the EHR. Uh, there may also be some performance limitations there, in particular when it comes to timing, because for these cards to be useful, they need to be, dis be displayed pretty quickly in the context of a clinical workflow. And we try to set sort of timing guidelines and expectations that these cards should be returned by a decision support service sort of quickly on the order of, of hundreds of milliseconds or maybe half a second. Uh, but this is not something that we expect to be sort of waiting for for five or 10 seconds and popping the cards into the workflow um, sort of willy-nilly. Uh, so we've got a, a mechanism called prefetch, which we'll talk about in a bit, that can help uh, with that kind of performance implication uh, as well, so that if there's common requests, uh, they can be made ahead of time, and we don't have to wait for the service to go and run them again. Uh, so a little bit about what comes along with that hook payload. I mentioned that, that different hooks can have different context expectations, and part of our hook catalog, which I'll show you in a little bit, is to, dis is to list for each hook we define a set of parameters, context parameters, uh, and each parameter is either optional or required, um, and each parameter has a, a sort of data type associated with it. So I'll, I'll give you a sense of what that catalog looks like when I show you the spec in a moment. But when you're defining a hook, you always define the context that goes along uh, with that hook. Uh, and then when it comes to that performance question earlier, if you're building a decision support service for medications and you always want to know the allergies, even though it's not part of the context, it's not part of the official set of context that the hook defines, you can register with your service what we call a prefetch request. And this is a way to say, every time you call me, every time the EHR is going to call me, I want that EHR to go and fetch the allergies first and include those in the call. Um, we label this as totally optional, so not every EHR is going to support it, but it's an important performance enhancement, and it gives EHRs uh, a way to package up a set of data that's, that's likely to be richer and that's likely to supply more of the hook's needs. Uh, and since every service might have different requirements, we allow those services to effectively register um, a set of those requirements when they're configured to work inside of the EHR. And I'll give you a sense of, of how that works in particular um, 
when we talk about service discovery. But the idea behind prefetch uh, is you've got a set of calls you almost always want to make. Uh, you want to limit the latency that it takes to go out and make them, and it's an optional performance uh, enhancement. I'm going to say just a little bit about um, security. Uh, there's two directions that this works in. A CDS service needs to know that the call it's getting from the EHR is legitimate, so it needs to authenticate the EHR that's invoking it. And then on the other hand, the EHR, if, it, if it's going to be exposing a fire server for the CDS service to talk to, uh, it needs to protect that fire server in some appropriate way. So the CDS hook spec comes with a set of security uh, specifications that work in both of those cases. Uh, so first of all, when the EHR is calling the CDS service, uh, it's always making that call over TLS, so it can authenticate the, the sort of server side of that. And the EHR is always going to pass along an authentication header when it's making that request. And that authentication header is a signed JSON web token. I've got some details in the slide deck that we probably won't talk about unless folks are, are interested in digging into more detail. But it includes that signed token with the request so that the CDS service can validate the token uh, before proceeding to generate advice. Um, and then the EHR also passes along one more thing. It, it can pass along an access token, very short-lived access token that the service can use if it needs to fetch more data back from the EHR's fire server. Uh, so when the, server is, when the service is invoked, it's got everything it needs to go ahead and reach back into the EHR uh, to ask for some additional data. And I mentioned that we use this JSON web token uh, for that authentication piece. Uh, there's an example of what some of the claims in it are. We can talk about them uh, afterwards if folks want to go into more detail on it. But I also want to talk about one more thing, which is the notion of discovery. So when an EHR wants to configure a new set of CDS services, you know, how does that happen? Well, a CDS service provider hosts what's called a discovery endpoint. It's always uh, at this base URL called cds-services. So if you know the base URL of a, of, a, of a CDS service, you can call that URL and get back this discovery document, which is a list of the services provided um, at this endpoint. Uh, and each one says, here's the hooks that I'm good for. Here's uh, my name and description. And it also says, here's the prefetch information that I want. So this is how a CDS service can communicate to the EHR information about the data that it expects to see or that it hopes to see when it's invoked. Um, so for example, if we've got a service that is going to display a simple greeting uh, when a patient record is loaded, that service might say, I, need you to, to, I would like you to fetch the patient for me. Um, so I would like you to create a JavaScript object every time you call me with a key called patient to greet. Uh, and the value should be filled out by executing this as a fire API get call. Uh, so the EHR, if it supports this kind of prefetch mode, uh, will look at this fire call. It'll evaluate this context parameter of the patient ID. And so it'll do something like get patient slash 123, if 123 is the current patient in context. EHR will include that payload, that patient resource, in the invocation each time it goes and calls the CDS service. So discovery gives you sort of an end-to-end -end way to configure all the details you need about one or more services uh, that you want to connect to. So I want to make this a little bit more tangible by giving you a view of our CDS hooks sandbox. So it's sandbox.cds-hooks.org. Uh, and I'm just going to try to open this up in a browser window here. The idea of the sandbox is to give developers a sense of how all of this works, and to give CDS service developers a way to try out services that they're building in the context of a, a web-based environment that makes it easy to sort of debug and see what's happening. So by default, when you visit the sandbox, uh, there's going to be a, a patient already in context. It's a patient called Daniel Adams. Uh, but you can change the patient that's in context if you want. There's settings for that up in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, but the idea of the sandbox is on the left-hand side here, it's sort of like a very impoverished EHR environment. Uh, in particular, it's, it's just got a patient face sheet and it's got a medication prescribing screen. Uh, but over time, as we expand our example catalog, uh, we expect that this is going to become a, a richer and slightly more believable uh, EHR environment. Uh, but the idea is, as a, as a user of this sandbox, maybe you're on the medication prescribing screen and you're going to go ahead and write a prescription um, for a drug. It's got a little uh, drug database in it that's based on RxNorm. Uh, and as you're clicking through, as you're starting to prescribe this medication, CDS hooks are being invoked uh, in the background, and cards are being returned. And each card is being displayed here um, in the context of your clinical workflow. Uh, so in this case, we've got a card here uh, from a service that's telling me how much this med is going to cost, which is roughly $1,200 a month. Uh, and then it has a suggestion for saving me 
roughly $1,200 a month by switching it to a generic version of this drug. And if I click on that button, my user uh, interface will be updated. I've switched from Zofran, which is the brand name, to Ondansetron, which is the generic. Uh, and now the whole thing happens again. A new hook is invoked, service returns a new card, and in this case, it's just some pricing information that this is gonna be a $50 a month prescription. And so that's a quick view of the sort of clinical workflow of what's happening, but the idea of this sandbox is that it's a developer tool. So you can see as a developer what's happening under the hood. Well, there was a request that was issued uh, to a service endpoint, and the request looks like this. It's got the hook, which is, tells me it's a medication prescribe hook. It's got information about the fire server to connect to. It's got that context we talked about um, with the patient ID and a list of medications that are being prescribed. And then you can see the response, which is what my CDS service sent back. In this case, it's a list of cards, a list of one cards uh, in this particular case. Uh, and so we see the cost summary and the label and the fact that this is an information level indicator. This gives you a way to see what's happening under the hood as these CDS services are invoked. And you get uh, to invoke two kinds of services. One is the medication prescribed, and the other is uh, the patient view. So in this case, there's a, a pre-configured service that just displays the patient's name with now seeing in front of it. Uh, very simple, and from the developer perspective you, perspective, you get a sense of what's happening under the hood. We're gonna come back to the sandbox uh, in a little bit when I show you an example of how you can start developing uh, your own service uh, and testing it out inside of the sandbox. Before we do that, I wanna say a few words about sort of what's in scope for 1.0 and what's coming later. Um, so really critically, uh, in 1.0 of the specification, we have a way to launch an app. That's the app link card that I told you about. Uh, but if the app takes a clinician through a flowchart and helps the clinician make a decision, in our 1.0 release, there's no automatic way to return that decision back to the EHR. It basically just tells the, the clinician, hey, you might want to go back to your EHR and change the drug to X. Um, so it's sort of a cold handoff. Uh, after 1.0, we've got a detailed specification uh, about how to provide those decisions in an automated way back to the EHR uh, to close the loop. So a decision that gets made in the app propagates into the user experience of the EHR. And one of the major components of making that work is a new specification that we're calling smart web messaging. That's the session that I'm gonna do with Janet Campbell from Epic uh, right after this one in, in Chalet 2. So if you're interested in that, that's the place to come. Um, we're also thinking a lot about performance. So we, we need to understand realistically, how quickly these CDS hooks can return uh, in the real world. Uh, and the model that we propose involves calling a lot of hooks a lot of times over the course of a clinical workflow, uh, including some hooks uh, that, that might really not be appropriate or might not be relevant very often. So in my bilirubin example, uh, I might want to display an app link to that bilirubin app every time a newborn chart is open, every time somebody's in the first 48 hours of life. That might be a relevant link to show. Uh, but today in CDS hooks, we just say, Here's a list of services that are always going to be invoked every time any patient record is open. So you might be calling that Billy Rubin service hundreds of times a day for patients who are two hours old, but also two years old and 20 years old. Um, and it could be very inefficient because most of the time that service is just going to respond with an empty list of cards because the patients aren't relevant. So we're also working on a concept called trigger guards that would give you some way to, to limit when you need to make a call out to these external services so you know which kinds of, uh, which kinds of patients or which kinds of context are going to be appropriate and you can avoid making calls when you know that they're not going to return any useful events or any useful uh, advice. Uh, and then we're also thinking a lot about other kinds of triggers for CDS uh, hooks. So all of our triggers so far have been based on the user experience, things that happen inside of the workflow in the EHR, but there might be background events that are just as relevant. So uh, things that could be as simple as a timer, uh, every, every hour go and, and run some check and see if, if things are happening as expected or see if there's anything new, uh, or event-based. So when a new Billy Rubin lab result comes in from the lab, um, go and recompute this kind of information. Uh, so we think that there are several additional ways that we might want to be able to trigger uh, these hooks. Um, and then there are many more detailed implementation guides that we think need to be written on top of this sort of base specification. So for example, radiology ordering, uh, when you want to look at a set of proposed imaging orders, you know, a clinician is going to prescribe an MRI for a patient who's been having headaches, uh, and you want to get some advice from an external system. This is particularly important in the context of US-based care because there are um, federal regulations requiring that EHRs, 
be able to ask for external decision support advice in the context of this kind of radiology imaging prescribing because it can be very expensive uh, and because clinicians don't always know about the guidelines or don't always follow them closely. So there's strong interest in making sure that software can call out to these kinds of services for, for radiology uh, imaging orders, and we probably need some specialized advice here. So uh, an implementation guide that spells out details like when an external service is reviewing a set of imaging orders, uh, how can it return information to say like, this is totally fine, no need to bother the user with anything, but the EHR can log a little statement that says, yep, we checked and it was good. Those kinds of things, which will come out as we start digging into specific use cases uh, like imaging or like opioid decision support guidance. I mentioned uh, this concept of capturing decisions that are made inside of an app and returning them back to the EHR. Um, there's a link here to a GitHub doc with a lot more details on that front. I just included it in the slide deck, so if you're following along and you want to see exactly what's being proposed to solve that problem, you've got a link to follow up on. Um, and another thing that we're looking at post 1.0 is the ability to provide service developers with more information uh, about what's happened once they've returned suggestion cards into the EHR. So, for example, you might suggest a cheaper drug. Did the user take your suggestion? Um, it's hard to know. One of the things that we're working on is a way to, to send, back, send information back to the CDS service to say, here are the suggestions that a user took. Uh, and this is particularly important because, on the one hand, these kinds of suggestions are just sort of sharing clinical guidance. But on the other hand, they're meant to be persuasive, right? This shares a lot in common with kind of internet advertising. You're trying to display a short message that convinces a user to do something. And unless you can measure the feedback symbol, uh, signal about whether the users actually took your advice, it's going to be hard to know how to tweak your message, how to change the wording to know what's going to be the most effective. So closing that loop is particularly important for helping service developers um, become more skilled uh, in convincing users about the right choices to make. So a few reference uh, links here to the official specification, to the sandbox that I showed you, and to the source code for, for everything behind the spec. Uh, last thing I want to show you is a very quick view of a tutorial um, that the Cerner team wrote last year. So the tutorial is hosted on GitHub uh, in the Cerner org at cds-services-tutorial. Uh, but I also made uh, a live web link that you can follow here, which just has the same content in it uh, in a service called REPL.IT, which is sort of a, a web-based uh, interactive development environment. So I just took the code from Cerner's GitHub and, and pasted it in here. Um, and I want to give you a quick look at how this works, because you can follow the link to this live REPL, and you can go ahead and fork it to make your own copy of it to start playing with this very easily in the context of the web browser. So I just want to show you this workflow. Um, each REPL is hosted at uh, a web URL here. So in this case, my REPL is being hosted at cdshookstutorial.joshmandel.repl.co. Uh, and if I go ahead and try to load this, I get a message saying cannot get slash. Uh, why do I get that? Well, this tab here has a little web application written in Node.js, and it is configured to respond only on certain URLs, and slash is not one of them, but slash CDS services is one of them. That's the discovery document that we talked about earlier. So if I show you what this looks like, if I follow this CDS services link, you'll see I get this little JSON document back with, with the services that are offered in this little demo app. Um, and what I want to show you here is how I can take this URL, this discovery document link, and add it to the sandbox. So right now, the sandbox is configured with some demo services. It doesn't know about this service that I've been developing on REPL.IT, but I can go into configuration here and say, add CDS services, and I'm going to paste in that link uh, that I just showed you so that the sandbox can learn about, can be introduced to the service that I'm developing here. And once I do that, you saw this card just popped into being. Uh, this is the card that's being hosted by the service that I'm developing over in that other tab. And I just want to give you a quick sense of, of how that works once it's configured. I can go back to the tab here where I'm writing my service, and this is the part of the, the service that's actually returning some text. It's returning the summary text on the patient greeting. So I'm going to make a new greeting all right, and save that. And once I've done that, I can go back over to the sandbox and re-invoke the hook. So I'm going to click on patient view here again to re-trigger all those hooks. Um, in that case, my card just disappeared. What I really wanted to happen uh, was that the, the language is going to be updated. OK. Uh, it took the service a moment to restart. So now you can see a new greeting shows up here. So the idea is we want to make it as easy as possible. You can be hosting that app at localhost or repl.it or on a development server that you've got in your own organization. 
and you can easily um, connect it to our sandbox. So I will pause there. I think that we've got five minutes for questions. Is that, is that, do I have the timing right? Awesome. Yeah, please. Um, at some point uh, for EDAP decisions, uh, you had uh, in the spec uh, this notion of uh, redirect URL and then a second post. So is this is all gone now from the spec? Is that right? Yes. So going way back to 2015, when I first sort of proposed the scope for this spec, um, this decisions thing, capturing decisions that are made in an app, um, was part of the spec. And we did it using back and forth redirect in the browser. Uh, we took that out of the 1.0 publication of the spec because it's something that deserved a little bit more time and attention to look at sort of the, the set of options that might address that problem. There were, there were some concerns about limitations of that kind of redirection. So we took it out of the 1.0 release so that we could think carefully about it and add it back in 1.1 uh, once we had a, an approach that we all agreed on and liked. So it's gone, but equivalent functionality will be coming back. And my guess is that it's, it's not going to be based on in-browser redirects, but rather it will be based on web messaging instead. Other questions or comments? Yeah, please. So when you have to go to another um, fire server, and this is not the fire server you have uh, in, the, in the list, and you have to do an authentication on the server as well, how would you do this then in the uh, CDS hooks? So let me make sure I've got the question right. You, you're a decision support service. You've just been invoked with this, this hook. So you've received a call saying, hey, clinician123 just, has just opened up patient456. They're looking at the face sheet. Do you have any cards? Right. And, and you, as a service, need to go and fetch additional data. That, that's the use case we're additional talking about. Additional data from another fire server. This is not uh, the fire server, which is in the, so, in the call. So that... The thing that's sort of in scope for CDS hooks is telling you as the service developer how to go and look data up about patient 456 in the system that called you. If you want to go and look up data in a different system, that's sort of, it's allowed, but it's out of scope for our spec. We can't give you advice about how to do it because it's a different system by definition. We don't, we don't know how to do it in that system. Does that make sense? Yeah. For example, when you have to go to a government server to look up something or something like that. Yes. So that would be, you know, you would follow that government server's rules about how to access it. We, we can't really say much about that at the CDS hooks level. Please. Hi. Hi. Um, is there any way to execute a hook asynchronously and sort of subscribe to the result? And, um, and what's the implications of, um, so when you're executing a, a synchronous hook, does that, have the potential to sort of block a workflow or, or block a, a screen in a clinical system from advancing to the next bit or whatever? Yeah, so this is an important question. The, the, the scope that we've sort of taken on to start has been synchronous decision support integrated in the workflow. Uh, the idea being, uh, if, this is, if there's a possibility that you could be getting critical advice back that's going to impact your decision, uh, we can't be waiting sort of unbounded amounts of time uh, to hear that and like, pop up a message after the fact that surprisingly says, hey, remember that thing you did 10 seconds ago? Well, it was wrong. Go back and change it. So early on, we focused just on these synchronous calls that are supposed to return quickly. Um, I, I think that there's some important exploration for us to do, particularly about the kinds of advice um, that, aren't, that don't pertain to a narrow workflow step, um, but rather pertain to the kinds of checks that you want to be running in the background in the longer term. Um, so I'd love to explore that area. There's nothing in the spec for it today. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Thanks, great pre presentation and very exciting stuff. Um, you told that uh, on the connectons, there's a huge group doing stuff with CDS hooks. Are people already using this in production-like environments? So, uh, so the short answer, which is, I think, either entirely correct or almost entirely correct, is no. Uh, this is not really in production today. Uh, we've got a commitment from a couple of major vendors. Cerner and Epic have both said they intend to support it when it hits 1.0. It's supposed to hit 1.0 towards the end of this year or very early next year. And so my guess is that we're going to start seeing some production support for information cards and app link cards coming online in 2019. But it's still speculative. I would say, you know, this started a few years after Smart on Fire. And so my benchmark for this is, how many places can I run Smart on Fire today, and, and how broadly supported is that? And then I sort of add a few years. That, that's, that's about the time frame that I'm looking at, is late 2019. All right, thanks a lot. I'll be around uh, for the rest of the afternoon.